to Concord, to Europe, and to the European Parliament. Change your development narrative. Change your development education. Development can no longer be that race towards the United States or Germany or France. It is now an integrated process which involves nature and human beings swimming together or sinking together. Don't forget, when we talk about north and south, there is north and south in the north, there is north and south in the south. But the funny thing is that both the north in the north, members of the north, those who belong to the north in the north, and those who belong to the north in the south, they are one. They meet. They agree among themselves. Systemic change is needed because the liberal agenda of the past affects and infects their entire thinking the inequalities we're talking about, all that you are seeing, it's a product of a thinking that has permeated our entire and total being. And we plan on the basis of that totalitarianist system, which is, you want itself to be absolute, which cannot be questioned. If we are not addressing inequalities, we can do whatever we want for a thousand more years in development aid and will not make a dent. At the initiative of our previous and still now Commissioner Mimitsa, we have been developing the staff working document. I'm not sure how many have read it, but it's basically looking at how we can systematically and more systematically as we have done before integrate that in all we do in our development cooperation in defco what we said is it's clear that we cannot go out as eu and preach to the others inequality if our own inequality is rising if you don't have a global system at least in the in the nation and ideally in the EU and ideally globally, then the, the municipalities, the provinces, the national, the global levels, there's the competition and that is allowing then the multinationals to shift and uh, in the end there's no tax paid anywhere. Sometimes we have the impression that the social element is a little bit forgotten. We speak a lot about environment, which of course climate change is extremely important, but never forgetting about the social element as well. We have come to a, a time where uh, the, the social contract has broken. And this is uh, very true because if we look outside at the reality, we, we, we find a situation where, you know, the 70% of people do not enjoy uh, universal social protection. 80% of people still, uh, you know, say that they don't have a wage uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to live, to live on. 60% um, of people still work uh, in an informal economy, uh, so in an informal environment. So these are really um, scary, uh, scary figures, scary percentage that are relevant and fundamental when we are talking about fighting inequality. If we don't implement the labor agenda uh, within the SDGs, of course, uh, the, the old framework will be impossible to uh, achieve. When you ask me about new path and new business model, my mind goes directly to the circular economy. And the reason why I think to that topic first is because personally I've been involved in a three-year project that was funded by the European Commission, so it was an Horizon 2020 project in which we really tried to see and to study new business models in order to accelerate the transition uh, in, in Europe. For sure, circularity is really the way to go because circularity has the potential to have economic, environmental and social benefits. 
benefits at the same time. We need new incentives in order to make circular products and circular uh, materials more sustainable and more attractive uh, for companies. Then the second problem that we saw by working with uh, those companies is that there is a perceived lack of consumer demand because consumers don't know what circularity is. Maybe some of them are not particularly environmentally conscious. So it is important to have more awareness campaign to increase the demand. The economic well-being only does not give the whole picture. So the, the countries that are scoring highly on economic well-being doesn't actually, uh, do not actually score well on the overall SDG uh, 8 uh, achievement. And this is also linked because the, the countries that are scoring better are also the country where social dialogue is actually implemented and there is a stable social dialogue uh, patterns. I think that we really have to realize that indicators uh, is true, they are not the solution, but on the other hand, the choice of selecting indicators, it's a political choice. What we see now when democracy is uh, under threat in more and more countries, in our own European Union, in many other places where we have some leaders that can be copied by many other leaders that, and that are not really uh, uh, true. Democrats, it's very important that we um, reconquer democracy all the time with all its aspects. And I wanted to raise something that I find important, and that is that when, uh, when um, the International um, Institute for Democracy and uh, Electoral Assistance in Stockholm, IDL, when they uh, scrutinize this, they see that sustainable democracies have a strong um, uh, elements of participation and what they call egalitarian, meaning that you will not have a sustainable democracy if you do not look at participation. And here we have the shrinking space issue, the role of parliaments, and uh, many, many other aspects. The civil society is the closest to the people. You know, an African proverb says, the person who sits by the fire can tell you how much it burns. Uh, if you don't, if you are not closer to civil society, you will never know the mind of the people. And if you don't know the mind of the people, asking the question of data there, you cannot know who is being left behind. I would say straight, is people living with disability, for six to seven good years, as a civil society, we have been fighting to ensure there is a law that protects people with disability. We failed, government never listened. Until we invited the majority of the people living with disability to a three-day workshop, and they were living together with us. And we, they, we arrived at what they call a strategic plan for the PWD. My organization took two buses with drivers, and we put uh, petrol inside, and told the guys, you say you need to be the traditional rulers. This is the vehicle. You say you want to meet the parliamentarian. These are the vehicles. You go yourself and ask them why the bills protecting them has not been passed. Where it took us six to seven years with no results. They disabled themselves going out. Can you just imagine the scene? They, those who have no legs, the deaf, the dumb, jumping, driving into the palace of the big man and occupying it. Automatically, the traditional rulers in Africa have very strong influence. They pick the phone, call the governor, call the member of the parliament. What is happening to the bill of these guys? Within three months, the law was passed. Three months. And now, the government has included in the budget the fact that ministries and parastatals have to make provision of 20% for people dealing with disabilities. Now we can begin to monitor how that law is being implemented. So it works to get civil society to target the appropriate people needed. Yes. What is important is, of course, redistribution. Uh, what is important is also, speaking about corruption, uh, transparency in government, local and national, uh, so, cheat, so that cheating can actually be avoided. We've had that since 1766, long before we 
hard uh, democracy. What is important is labor market and decent work, and we've also launched an international initiative called Global Deal, where we now have more than 100 partners, countries, companies, uh, and uh, trade unions, including ITU, you see, uh, to promote uh, workers' rights and decent work. The other is, of course, general welfare. Um, and there is a debate about cash transfers or general welfare. And we believe that if we really are to tackle inequalities, you, you have to have general welfare policies. This is, is, is about free education, free health care. Um, but it's also about redistribution, for example, to children. What we have is allowances for children, no matter if their parents are rich or poor. And this creates support for uh, redistribution. If we want really to fight inequality, we should more go definitely ver ver towards a universal um, you know, approach. We are trying to put um, indicators, in, in indicators and inequality markers in all our future programs to first do an assessment of inequality per country and how we can address it with our development cooperation and then have markers and indicators that show us the monitoring on how this impacted on uh, inequality. But also in our staff document we say it's key to work together with our partner countries because in the end it's also a matter of political will and that goes to the heart of the power structures in our partner countries. Now this is so complex that it's very hard to address but we have realized of course that we cannot do that only with development cooperation policies. So we are trying to connect the internal, the external and using all the tools of the EU including political dialogue. My last point is then gender. Uh, we got rid of family taxation and moved to individual taxation in the 60s. And uh, daycare and parental leave uh, also for fathers make the society work well. It gets rid of inequalities between uh, man and woman and it provides a very good basis uh, for interaction in society. <laughs>